Um, good evening, everyone. I am Eric Flesch, the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, and welcome to this fifth of seven presentations as part of the 2021 Winter Lyceum. Today is the 14th day of March 2021, and I am broadcasting from Wisconsin's hilly Driftless area from the city of Platteville, home of the world's largest letter M on beautiful Platte Mound in the heart of the upper Mississippi Valley lead and zinc mining region where the Badger State was born. This is a special year for our museums. Um, it was founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville and 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the completion of the mining museum, the 45th anniversary, of the opening of the Bevins lead mine in the museum's backyard and the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Rollo Jameson Museum. So we have many programs and initiatives in store for this special year that integrate the two distinct aspects of our museum's identity, the humanities aspect of history and culture and the STEAM aspect of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And our holistic place-based approach celebrates human ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development, what might be called the pioneering spirit in the context of our region over a long timeline. I invite you to stay up to date on these and many more programs designed to inspire optimism in our community and to connect Platteville's past to its bright future. You can make your reservations and donations online at www.mining.jameson.museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, evening to enjoy a presentation by Danielle Benden and Robert Bozhart titled Archaeology of the Southern Driftless Area. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate today. I extend a particularly warm welcome to current friends of the mining and Rollo Jamison Museum's members and donors. And I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. Taco John's H&R Block, a w Restaurant of Platteville, Inspiring Community, and Southwest Health. And now, before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we are a group of well over 170 and we're doing this via Zoom, in the interest of time, I invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during the talk. At the end, uh, Danielle and Ernie will answer as many of the questions as they are able. So I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, archaeologists Danielle Benden and Robert Ernie Bozhart, our owners of Driftless Pathways, LLC. They have spent together more than five decades researching, conducting field work, and publishing books and articles on the archaeology of Wisconsin's Driftless area. Uh, one of uh, Ernie's recent books about rock art um, which, by which they mean Native American paintings and carvings, entitled Hidden Thunder, won the Midwest Book Award. For nearly 30 years, Bozhart worked at the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center on the campus of the UW La Crosse, serving as regional archaeologist and then as associate director. Ms. Benden spent more than a decade as the curator of anthropology at the UW Madison, where she taught museum and archaeology courses curated the anthropology collections and oversaw numerous renovations of the anthropological curation facilities. For nearly 20 years, Benden and Bozhart have directed the Trumpelow Archaeology Project and developed the Trumpelow Interpretive Path, a series of three interconnected community archaeology projects in Trumpelow, Wisconsin. Through Driftless Pathways, Benden and Bozhart lead archaeological site tours across Wisconsin. They work with museums, libraries, and historical societies on the development and installation of interpretive exhibits and the design and redesign of new curation facilities. In fact, I'm excited to announce that our museum has recently been awarded a major grant from Wisconsin Humanities for a project titled Native American Lithics at the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, Identification and Interpretation. Now, Danielle and Ernie will be an important collaborators with us on that project. It's my honor to welcome Danielle Benden and Ernie Bozhart. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. Really appreciate it. We're so happy to be here with you all today um, to talk about the archeology span of the Southern Driftless. Um, we are going to be tag teaming here a little bit. So I'm going to start out and then Ernie will um, 
we'll take over and we'll just kind of go back and forth a little bit. Eric did such a good job uh, introducing us that I don't need to say much on this slide. Um, just that, you know, Ernie and I have spent together uh, more than six decades of doing archaeological research in the upper Mississippi River Valley, the Driftless area. Uh, we continue to do field work, although we're doing less and less and more um, writing up our research. Uh, as Eric said, we also work with museums and we give tours of archaeological sites. Today, we're going to focus on the, the southern driftless. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the driftless area. On my slide, you'll see the driftless area here in the dotted blue line. That's the area, of course, that the driftless or that the glaciers never um, came to um, during the, the glaciation periods of, of other parts of Wisconsin. Here is the driftless area blown up on the left. Um, we are going to be talking about um, the southern driftless, which is the area uh, south of the Wisconsin River in Wisconsin. Um, we're not going to go into uh, sites in, in Illinois because, of course, the driftless area doesn't just end at Wisconsin's state line. It's in the northern part of Illinois, uh, northeastern Iowa, and southeastern Minnesota. So again, today we're going to take you on a tour of human history. Uh, uh, of the southwestern part of Wisconsin, south of the Wisconsin River. So this part of Wisconsin, and really all of Wisconsin, is um, ancestral homeland to many Native American tribes. Um, the map on the left shows the current reservations and tribal lands in Wisconsin today. There are 11 federally recognized tribes some have reservations, some have trust lands, like you can see here, this is the Ho-Chunk Trust Land. Um, and uh, there are many tribes that were here that are no longer resident tribes. The map on the right-hand side shows the, the treaty, um, the treaties. And so this is a, a deeper look at um, ancestral homeland. And you can see again, south of the Wisconsin River, we're talking primarily about Ho-Chunk ancestral territory. Also this green is Potawatomi. And then this little yellow area here is um, represents the Sauk and the Fox. Bottom line is that many, many, many Native American tribes and communities came through what is now Wisconsin for since people first arrived here 13,000 years ago. It is, however, recognized, though, that Ho-Chunk have a very deep ancestral history to, to southwestern Wisconsin and really all of what is now Wisconsin. And if you talk to Ho-Chunk people, they'll say, we have always been here since time immemorial. And so it's really um, helpful to us as archaeologists to talk with the Ho-Chunk when we're doing our work because who better to tell about their history than themselves? Uh, Ho-Chunk is, is still alive and well today that with a very rich um, cultural tradition um, and uh, are active participants in the work that we do as well. Today, we're gonna be talking a lot about what's called a seasonal round. And this basically means the way in which people move across the landscape at different times of the year in search of particular resources that become abundant at different times of the year. So people have lived this way almost until when the French get here, when the Europeans arrive, people are moving across the landscape in particular areas at different times of the year. This is the, the Ho-Chunk season around and you can see across the, the top of the wheel are the months of the year. So right now we're in what Ho-Chunk would call the last bear month. And you can see the Ho-Chunk names for all of the months are on the outside of the wheel. You can see also the differences of the different resources that are available at different times of the year that people are relying on. So for example, in the summer, people congregate in large groups along the Mississippi River, the Wisconsin River, other tributaries where resources are abundant. There's fish, there's turtle, there's abundant natural resources. And so that can support a large group of people living together. In the winter, however, people need to disperse into the interior parts of, of the driftless and break up into smaller family groups in order to survive the what we call the season of starvation. It is 
tough to survive a Wisconsin winter in prehistory. And so people are moving in in small family groups into the interior, taking up residences in rock shelters um, and relying really heavily on white-tailed deer to stay alive. So we will talk consistently about this seasonal round, this pattern of moving and living on the landscape in harmony with you know, all the resources and as they become abundant at different times of the year. Today, we are gonna be talking of course about archeology. span And so archeology span is the study of the human past. And it's sort of like putting together a puzzle that has a lot of missing pieces. We only see the things that people left behind or lost or sometimes that they threw away. A lot of times we're, we're look, relying on people's garbage to help reconstruct what life was like for people at different periods of time. So on the left-hand side, this is an excavation of a, of a um, fire hearth. This is a fire pit and it's full of deer bone and broken bits of pottery and stone tools. And by excavating that, we can look at the details and help to figure out what people were eating, um, what times of year the site was occupied. Here's another example. Here's a stone ax head that was found um, in situ in the, in the ground as we were excavating. But essentially we're taking these artifacts and what we're trying to do is put the pieces of the puzzle together to really reconstruct what life was like. Um, how did people live? What were their social interactions like? What was their political system, their religious beliefs? Um, what did they eat? How did they move on the landscape? Where were they living at different times of the year? It's an incredibly difficult thing to do with just a small snapshot, just a small piece of the things that, that are left behind. There's no written record. There's no, we don't know what languages they spoke prehistorically. We don't know, um, you know, what their clothes look like because those things don't preserve. So we rely heavily on working in tandem with, with native people to help with the, fill in the gaps with oral history to get a better picture of what, what life was like at different periods of time. And over the course of doing this work, we've learned a lot. And we've learned that native people have been here since about 13,000 years in what is now Wisconsin. Archeologists rely a lot on the changes of artifact styles through time to construct a timeline. And so we have um, come up with a set of terms to help us mark certain um, periods of time. So across the top, we have the Paleo Indian tradition, the archaic tradition, Woodland, Oneota, and then the contact era when the, the French arrived. Um, and so we're gonna kind of take you through the, this you know, 13,000 year human history in the Southern Driftless and show you some of these sites. And as you'll notice, things change dramatically through time and people are resilient and incredibly adaptive at you know, relying on and changing with the changing climate, with the changing landscape and with what's available. Um, and it's really an incredible story of resilience and adaptation through time. Um, Ernie's gonna take over here and talk first about the Paleo Indian tradition. This is the end of the last ice age when the glaciers are retreating and it's when megafauna, these are large animals like mastodons and mammoths, giant beavers, um, were roaming the landscape and people were using handheld spears to, to kill them for food. Um, they use this very distinctive type of stone tool called a Clovis point. It has a flute here or a little channel taken out and that was hafted onto a wooden um, shaft. And then, you know, those were the weapons used to take down these massive beasts. Uh, and you'll see the changes through time, the changes in the way the spear points, and then eventually the projectile points for arrow tips. You'll see the changes in the kinds of animals that are available. So when the megafauna become extinct, for example, people rely on bison, ex extinct forms of bison. And then when those become extinct, they rely heavily on deer and elk. And so 
this chart is just a snapshot of those changes that we see through time so that when we find artifacts on archaeological sites, we can reconstruct the seasonal round. So what time of year a site was occupied based on the kinds of things we find, but also what, you know, we're, how to place it in context in this broader, you know, tradition of, of, of living in, in what is now Wisconsin. So Ernie's going to take over. He's going to talk about the Paleo Indian and the archaic tradition. I'm going to come back and talk about woodland, and then he's going to wrap it up with Oneota. Uh, thanks, Dee. Um, so before I get to the Paleo Indian tradition, just a, a couple of quick comments about the Driftless area. Um, uh, it's a fabulous area. It's, it's this rugged terrain, and along the Mississippi and Wisconsin rivers, you've got these majestic bluffs. Um, and then you've got the interior valleys, which are which are uh, marvelous places for hunting deer and, and fishing and, and things like that. Um, the landscape we see today, this forested, uh, pretty much forested driftless area is very different, however, from what the landscape would have looked like for almost all of the time that Native Americans were here before the French got here. In fact, the landscape didn't look like this until about 100 years ago, and that's largely because um, in the in the long past, uh, before about 1850, prairie fires would have swept across the land, the southern Wisconsin, uh, and maintained the prairies. And the fire um, suppression didn't really begin until about uh, 1850s, when when pioneers came in and started plowing and building roads and putting out fires, and and that allowed the forest to grow. So, for most of the past, the landscape would have looked like the the painting in the lower right here that was done by Henry Henry Lewis along the Mississippi uh, in 1851. So it's, it would have been prairie oak savanna for the most part. Um, the Driftless area also has, because it's unglaciated, lots of rock outcrops. And in the rock outcrops, there's resources. There's flint stone for making stone tools, but there's also caves and rock shelters uh, that Danielle mentioned in terms of the season around that people would occupy in the wintertime. And I'll be talking about that with some of the rock shelter sites. Um, the this, this streams are all spring fed and that water doesn't freeze in winter. So interior localities, you could always get fresh water uh, and water crests and, and deer and things like that coming down to, to have a drink as well. Um, so to begin with the Paleo Indian tradition now, um, roughly 13,000 years ago when people first arrived in, in what is now Wisconsin, the landscape would have looked something like this. So northern Wisconsin still has glacial ice, and that's a mild, thick sheet of ice. It's cold here. Permafrost would have been in the Driftless area until about 14,000 years ago, maybe 13,000 years ago, and then vegetation would have started to grow. Southern Wisconsin, the Driftless area would have been a, a, a spruce park-like tundra environment, and on that landscape would have been mastodons, um, and other extinct forms of animals. There was horses and camels, early forms of those. There were giant beaver. The beaver weighed four to 500 pounds uh, at that time. And these are, these are animals that we call megafauna. And they roamed the landscape when people first arrived roughly 13,000 years ago. And we know that because we find the bones of these megafauna uh, across southern Wisconsin and particularly in bog environments in the Driftless area. So in the upper left is a reconstructed mastodon skeleton, which is called the Boaz mastodon. And it's on exhibit at the Geology Museum at UW-Madison. It was discovered in the late 1890s after a flash flood in a small stream head near the town of Boaz in Richland County, north of the Wisconsin River. Um, and there was a fluted point, uh, one of these Clovis points supposedly found with it. Um, and, uh, and so this is maybe one of the earliest kill sites in Wisconsin. Um, interestingly, about 10 years ago, Carrie Eaton in the lower right, who is a curator at the Geology Museum at UW-Madison, uh, was, was doing a, a, a research on the Boaz Mastodon because it was the 100th anniversary of, of, of when they, the, the, the reconstruction took place. And she learned that most of the Boaz Mastodon is not the Boaz Mastodon, that most of the bones actually came from a place called Anderson Mills, which is near Fenimore. And the picture on the, on the upper right is workmen digging into a bog at Anderson Mills and finding 
mastodon bones. You can see the gentleman on the left holding one of the leg bones of this mastodon that was found at the turn of the century. And, and, and those, the, the, those bones were then brought to UW Madison uh, and, and used to, to join with the Boaz mastodon bones to reconstruct that skeleton. So you can see the, in the middle, uh, the, bo the blue bones are from the Anderson Mills mastodon and the Boaz bones are red. So most of the Boaz mastodon is not the Boaz mastodon. <laughs> Um, the fluted points that Daniel talked about are the earliest recognized uh, tools for, for this region, in fact, almost all across North America. Uh, these date to roughly 13,000 years ago. Um, and it, in Grant County, there's the Withington site, uh, which is located only about 15 miles from Platteville. Um, and it's up on a ridge top, and it was found uh, by the, well, a family, the Withington family actually found these spear points. And then Harris Palmer, who was a geologist at, at State at Platteville University, uh, now University of Wisconsin Platteville, but then the State University, um, uh, went there and documented the site and did some excavations. And he found more fluted point parts, Clovis point parts, um, along with lots of hide scrapers and debitage and such. So, th but this was so. This is one of the earliest sites um, in in this region. What's interesting is that this set of fluted points here. Um, is, is that the materials that these are made of, well, most of them don't come from southwestern Wisconsin. These three, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but these three that I'm pointing to here are made out of a material called Hickston Silicified Sandstone, which comes from a place called Silver Mound in Jackson County, Wisconsin. It's 100 miles north of, of where the site is. Um, there's uh, this brown point here is made out of Knife River Flint, which comes from Western North Dakota, uh, several hundred miles to the west. There's a scraper from the Withington site, which comes, which is made out of a, a gray flint uh, that comes from Southern Illinois. Um, so, so Withington, th there's people who are at Withington probably uh, did a kill, and and they brought their materials with them from other places. Um, and then they, they, many of these points broke, uh, and then they were resharpened and then discarded and replenished with probably spear points and, and, and tools made from local materials. So Withington's pretty interesting. Uh, they may have been hunting actually caribou herds at this site. That's what the latest uh, um, sort of understanding of, of early paleo Indians in this part of the world is. Um, after 10,000 years ago, the megafauna pretty much became extinct. It probably had something to do with people coming in and hunting them for the first time. Um, so, so when that happened, people's technology had to change, began to change. They had to start hunting different animals. And as Danielle mentioned, they, for a while they hunted uh, extinct forms of bison called bison occidentalis, longhorn bison, um, and deer and elk. Um, uh, became more common. The projectile points at eight to 10,000 years ago looked like this set here on the right side. And these are from the Bass site, which is near Lancaster. It's up on the ridge top. Harris Palmer excavated it back in the uh, late, oh God, mid 1960s. Um, and, um, um, and what it is, is it, it's a place where there's a ravine head that comes up to the, towards the ridge top. And at eight to 10,000 years ago, the ravine eroded so that there was chert nodules, flint nodules there that these people came to and made stone tools. And they all, and all the stone tools you see here on the right, these are all called, these are called hardened bar points. So these are all eight to 10,000 years old, and they probably represent about a hundred years in time. Uh, these are Harris Palmer's excavation units. And uh, I'm sorry, Jim Stolt, sorry. Um, Danielle just correct me. Jim Stoltman excavated these from the University of Wisconsin Madison. My apologies. Um, these are his excavation units in the in the 1980s, I guess. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Apologies. Um, uh, but in the lower uh, photograph here, you can see that the top footer. So this is the plow zone. This is a plowed area, and that's all disturbed. But below the plow zone, all of this area right through here, these are flakes or waste debris from this, this local flint that they used to make the stone tool. And there were tens of thousands of these things uh, found uh, at, at the bass site. So it's a it's a eight to 10,000 year old site up on the ridge top where they were exploiting that flint that was exposed for a while. Uh, probably by 8,000 years ago that there was erosion that covered up the flint source again. It was never really used again uh, until it was found uh, within the, by, by the, the bass, well, the, by the family that owns the site. Um, 
after that period of time, uh, I'm going to talk about rock shelters a little bit. So this is Harris Palmer from the University of Wisconsin Plantville um, at the Preston Rock Shelter. And this is a, a typical sandstone rock shelter in the Driftless area. And rock shelters are great because they're, they're dry, sandy floors. Uh, there, you can keep warm inside in the winter time, um, and and they become places where the sites become stratified. So people live in the rock shelter, and they and then they leave it, and dirt and dust blows in, and it creates a sterile soil layer, and then people come back and live again, and they make charcoal, and and they break or they lose stone tools and such. Um, and then and then you get a layer of occupation and you get a sterile layer, layer of occupation. So on the right here, you can see in this wall, sort of like layers of dark and light. And the dark layers are occupation zones and the light lit areas are places where it was, it was abandoned for a period of time. Um, and basically as you dig down in a rock shelter, the, the deeper you go, uh, the older you get back in time. You're just peeling away like a layer cake. Um, Palmer's crews dug down 10 feet at the Preston Rock Shelter, and they never hit the bottom. Um, they got back about 7,000 years in time based on the artifacts. This is just an idea. These are artifacts. These are projectile points or spear points from the Preston Rock Shelter uh, that just show you sort of how they, things change through time. And these are reverse order. Um, the, the youngest ones are at the bottom, and those are arrowheads um, and then as you go from the bottom up uh, these are the, the next line the arrowheads are about a thousand years old the next line up these are about 2500 years old these are spear points uh, this line the durst points are 3000 years old and then these corner notch points preston corner notched named after the preston rock shelter about 3500 years old um, and then there were older ones found in the preston rock shelter as well so rock shelters are pretty cool besides the stratification they also have great preservation of things like bone and, and floral remains, plant remains. Uh, and, and so this is just an example of the kinds of things we can do with, with bones from rock shelters. And, and most of the bone mo in the rock shelters excavated in the driftless area are deer bones. You don't find fish, you don't find turtles, you don't find summer resources. The deer bones, when you find the cranium of the, of the bucks, if the antlers are attached, that's a fall kill. If the antlers are dropped, like up here, that's essentially after Feb after January, February, when the bucks drop their antlers. Um, the deer jaws uh, uh, for deer that are younger than three, year old, three years old, you can tell when that, when that deer was killed because the tooth eruption pattern is the same because all fawns are born, are born essentially in May. And so by looking at the tooth eruption pattern, you can tell if these deers are, deer are killed in the, in the fall or the spring or the winter or the summer, and all of them are killed in the fall, winter. Um, so, so rock shelters are winter occupation sites, and then you find lots of charred nutshell, which is a late summer, fall harvest that they're storing that the rock shelter they're bringing in there. Again, this is a season of starvation, um, and, and in the season around, rock shelters represent winter occupation. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about before I turn this back to Danielle um, is towards the end of the Archaic period. Uh, this is the Osceola site on the banks of the Mississippi River um, near Cassville. It was found in the 1940s, about 10 years after the Lock and Dam system uh, was built on the Mississippi River, which inundated much of the floodplain and created uh, wave erosion for the first time. And, uh, and in the 1940s, some fishermen came along uh, this bank here and they found lots of artifacts and some human remains. Um, and so they contacted the, uh, some archeologists and, and uh, um, archeologists from the Milwaukee Public Museum named Robert Ritzenthaler came out and he did some excavations and he found uh, this is the eroded bank right here, this black line. In the excavation area, each of these circles with a hatchback represents a bundle of human bones. So these are, these are burials uh, where the people died elsewhere and then they get that and then they left the bones out like on a scaffold or something like that where the, the flesh decomposed. They gathered up the bones, maybe at a winter occupation sites elsewhere, and then they brought them to the banks of the Mississippi River, which is a great place to live in the summertime, and buried them in a mass grave. The, the initial estimates were of, of several hundred people buried at the Osceola site. Um, 
with the burial pit, the, the mass grave, not with the individual burials, were distinctive kinds of spear points. And these are called Osceola points. All of these were found uh, at the Osceola site. Um, the other thing in this point is this, in this map, if you see these green uh, symbols here, those are copper artifacts that were found with the, in this mass grave. Now the copper comes from Lake Superior um, and, and copper was used in, in, during the archaic period in Wisconsin um, and, uh, and it's sometimes put place with burials. So, uh, and, in this, and the, these, this, the burial pit at Osceola, what it represents is the, one of the first cemeteries in Wisconsin. So this is where people begin to mark their territories um, in, a, in, a very, in a more recent analysis of the Osceola site suggested that there may have been humps of earth added to the top of the burial pit uh, that, that may have been used to mark that as, as, a, as, a, as a burial site. Um, where isn't it going? Sorry, there we go. Um, these are two, these are copper artifacts from the Osceola site that are in the Rollo Jameson Museum collections. They were, they were obtained by Rollo Jameson in 1945. This is his map of the site at that time. And he talks about the burial pit um, and, uh, and, and some of the things he found there. So this is, these are two copper awls. And this is a copper axe. And again, these are uh, at the, at the Rollo Jameson Museum. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Danielle. musical chairs here. <laughs> All right, so Ernie just gave you a, a nice summary of the Paleo Indian and archaic tradition. I'm gonna talk about the, the woodland tradition. So this is a period of time where there's quite a bit of change happening. Um, big adaptations and new technologies being um, invented at this period of time by people. It's the first time that people begin to build earthen mounds. The first mounds are these conical or dome-shaped mounds. Those are built about 2,000 years ago. And then by 1,000 years ago, people are building effigy mounds or mounds in the shape of animals. This is also the period of time in which people begin to create earthen pottery. So coiling clay, um, scraping so that the coils go away, and um, firing the pots in open air um, fire pits. People are also beginning to experiment with gardens, cultivate plants, and then they're still practicing that seasonal round. So living and congregating along the um, waterways, the Wisconsin River, uh, Mississippi River in the, the summer months, and probably a time where lots of people are gathering together, they're burying their dead, there are social activities going on. It's probably a good place where um, there's exchanges of marital partners um, or finding a marital partner. Um, there are ceremonies happening and it's just a complex um, system of you know, social, political, religious, um, you, you know, there's a lot going on. By the end of the woodland tradition, you get the bow and arrow. The bow and arrow comes in about 750 AD. So not that long ago, up until this point, people are hunting with just handheld spears and then something called an atlatl, which is a spear thrower. So it's huge in terms of, of the revolution. The bow and arrow um, is incredibly significant in terms of what happens um, at that period of time when it, when it uh, comes into being. So this is just a summary of the, the different kinds of pottery types through time. Again, archeologists uh, look for patterns and we look at stylistic differences through time. We also use things like radiocarbon dating and, and chemical analyses. There's so many new exciting technologies we can use to help us learn more about the past. But essentially you see differences in, in the, the shapes and the sizes of the pottery and the decoration types. So the first pots, um, like this Marion Thick, it's called in prairie in size. These are, um, it just as the name implies, really, really thick kind of clunky pots. They have, the Marion Thick has a flat bottom, but people begin to spend more time in one place during the woodland tradition. And pottery is, is a marker of that. You wouldn't want to lug this thing, um, you know, around in, you know, 
very, very often. So people are staying in, in places for a longer period of time um, during the woodland tradition. You get all sorts of decorations. Here's just an example of some of them. Um, the earliest pottery has fingernail impressions as a decoration. That's really common. And then you get all sorts of tool stamping. There's This is called rocker stamping, where a tool was rocked back and forth, maybe like a shell to create this decoration. This is a, a called a dentate stamped. Again, another curved tool to make um, the series of stamping. And then by the late woodland, you get what's called fabric and press pottery. And this is an example from the Broglie Rock Shelter. This is a where native people are actually weaving um, a, a, a collar that's then impressed into the wet clay to make this design into the pottery. By the middle woodland, there's um, it's a really fascinating thing happening and we call it the Hopewell interaction sphere. And essentially what it is, is groups of people over widely dispersed areas um, are involved in a trade network and you get artifacts from you know, Canada, you get copper and silver from, from Canada. Uh, you get marine shell from the Gulf of Mexico. You get uh, obsidian and other kinds of flints from the Rocky Mountains. And this, the, the Hopewell culture is, is centered in Ohio. However, um, there is a variant in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Hopewell. And so what we tend to see at this time in, middle, in the Middle Woodland period, um, are these elaborate burials with, with these, um, these grave goods coming from all over the place, traveling thousands of miles. And we see these things showing up in, in um, you know, burial mounds. One of the most, um, the biggest and most well-known in Wisconsin is called the Nichols Mound. This is in the northern part of the Driftless area in Trempolo. This was, Nichols Mound was excavated by the Milwaukee Public Museum in the late 1920s. They actually used a team of horses to um, excavate the center of this mound. Of course, we don't do that anymore. Mounds in Wisconsin are now protected um, and they are not excavated, generally speaking. Um, when they opened up this excavation area, what they found was a preserved birch bark roof. You can see it here. And so what this represents is actually the roof of like a mausoleum um, because that's what, what people were doing. There was a building and they, that's where um, people when they, when they died were, were buried inside of that building. And when that became full um, of, 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 of people, then it was closed by building the mound over the top. And presumably when that mound, when the Nichols mound was, was, was built over the top of this building, that roof collapsed and it preserved. It's really tremendous. In the Nichols mound were many, many, many examples of these exotic artifacts that show up in the Hopewell interaction sphere. So you, these are, you know, flint knives. This is uh, a obsidian from Yellowstone National Park. Some of these blades are, are two feet tall. I mean, they're just incredible. They're not meant to be used, but they're meant to be buried with an individual as, as a, um, you know, in a, in a ceremonial way. There's copper axes. This is a copper breastplate with woven fabric still attached. That's very unusual to find the fabric attached in the driftless area. Um, the, the copper actually preserved in this case, preserved this, this textile. So just really, really amazing in terms of, of the material culture, but it, most of the middle woodland sites are these burial sites. And um, there, there's not many known habitation areas. So these are like the cemeteries, but there's not many uh, middle woodland um, these sort of villages where people are living. There is one very excellent example in the Southern Driftless area called the Millville site. This is the uh, Joan Freeman. She was the state archeologist and in 1962, she excavated the Millville site. This is her mapping a house. And so all of these circular areas here represent where um, a, a pole would have been as the structure of the house. So this circular area here is one house she's in. And then you'll see these interior depressions. Here's one, here's another one. Those are storage pits inside the house. And if you look across this site, it's just tremendous amount of occupation. Here's another storage site pit. Here's another storage pit. I mean, they're just really everywhere. This is a map of the site. 
And in all, they identified 14 houses and they're sort of these larger circles on the map and many, many, many storage pits, the smaller uh, circles represent storage pits. Here's an example, by the way, of what you know one of those reconstructed houses would have looked like. These are wigwam structures, Ho-Chunk called them chipotakes. Um, and this was the common house type at this period of time. Um, this site is really important for our understanding of the Middle Woodland period, but also our understanding of the beginnings of, of horticulture. So uh, it's one of the first sites where you get wild rice, um, the cultivation of wild rice or collecting of wild rice. Uh, you, there was squash and nutshell, tremendous amount of white-tailed deer. And so what this tells us is that the site was occupied in the late fall, early winter. So again, all of these little clues help us reconstruct not only the time of year a site was occupied, but you know, period of time throughout human history as well. So the Millville site, very important. It's um, just a few miles from the Wisconsin River in Grant County, right on the banks of the south banks of the Wisconsin River. Another uh, site that is near and dear to my heart is the Brogley Rock Shelter. Um, the Brogley Rock Shelter is located very near Platteville. Um, it was excavated by Robert Nelson and his crew of what he called the Platteville Student Archaeologists. Bob Nelson was a middle school science teacher in Platteville, and he started a nonprofit uh, to um, encourage the volunteering uh, of the Platteville student archaeologists to help excavate the site. Many of these um, young boys were maybe headed on the wrong path or, or at risk, and so he kept them entertained and occupied by excavating the Brogley Rock Shelter. This is from the mid 1960s to the early 1970s. And here's Bob actually standing um, and looking in. And, and it's just amazing what they did. They, there were lights in there. They, I'll show you in just a second. They built um, uh, an entryway so they could excavate and close it off um, in the winter. They actually had a phone line in there because they had a house in Platteville that was donated to them where they were processing artifacts so they could call back and forth from the excavation site to the lab. Um, and so it, it's really an amazing story. When I was curator at UW-Madison about 10 or 11 years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Bob and I actually also met one of the Platteville student archeologists. Um, and so it just was a, it's a tremendous story. I also um, brought, some students here, and this is Connie Arzigian at UW La Crosse. So between UW Madison and UW La Crosse, we got students involved um, who did some additional um, publications on the work. Here's the that you know view of the Brogley Rock Shelter from about 2010, I think that was. Here's another picture of the Brogley Rock Shelter. Again, this is the structure they built, the Platteville student archaeologists built over to close it off so they could work. 12 months out of the year. Um, it's situated right along the Platte River. This is an, a, a map uh, that we had done with the help of um, John Lovis, Don Ryan, and Jennifer Schur. Uh, and they mapped this back in, I guess it was 2008. And then just some other shots. They screened all the dirt. These are some of the Platteville student archaeologists screening the dirt to look for artifacts. And this was just a site that had tremendous amounts of cultural deposits. It had a middle woodland deposit, but it also had occupation from the archaic period all the way to the late woodland till, uh, until about a thousand years ago. And so as Ernie mentioned, there's the stratigraphy, right? You can see it, the levels of occupation and rock shelter sites are excellent for preservation. And you can see here, this is, an, this is, is now in the laboratory. Uh, at the house in Plaidville. All of these are, are animal bones. So these are deer jaws. Uh, they're looking at snails here and doing analysis and report writing. Um, they're counting and weighing everything and trying to quantify what they found. Just some examples of some of the, the artifacts, stone tools again, from the archaic all the way to the late woodland. Here's an example of a middle woodland um, portion of a ceramic vessel, and then some just some really cool bone tools as well. By the 
end of the woodland, we call the late woodland period, you get a revolutionary accomplishment and it's the um, introduction of the bow and arrow. So as I mentioned, it's about 750 AD, the bow and arrow comes in. Up until that point, people are hunting with handheld spears and just spear throwers. And it's like a revolution. It's like you now can go from like a musket to like a repeating rifle. You can get multiple shots off now when you're hunting. And what happens is the pop people get so successful at hunting, the population explodes. And there starts to be some conflict because now the landscape becomes packed. The seasonal round starts to break down. Uh, people are now in the interior of the driftless in the, the, the summer and there's folks stuck on the, the Mississippi River in the winter because there's just so many people that seasonal round begins to break down. You also see um, changes in the pottery and the stone tool types. The pottery becomes much less thick, a little bit more finely made. And then the mound building continues, but instead of conical mounds, people begin to build effigy mounds or mounds in the shape of animals. These probably represent the first clan structures. Um, and so you see different styles. And when you start to look at um, effigy mounds, which by the way, are in the Southern um, half of Wisconsin, you can see some patterns. Um, for example, in the Southwestern part of the state, in the area we're talking about today, the Southern Driftless, you see bird mounds and you see what we call quadrupeds or four-legged animals with, with no tails. So like bear and deer forms. Um, in other parts of Wisconsin, you get these long tailed panther mounds or underworld spirits like these turtles. So what you're seeing is representations of the Native American worldview. There's the upper world uh, represented by the, like the sky, right? You see birds, lots of different forms of birds. The middle world or earth world where, where people are living, you get the quadrupeds like bear and deer, and then the underworld or underwater spirits. These are the turtles and the panthers. Again, probably representing the beginnings of early clan structure. Couple of examples of effigy mounds in this area. One is called the Roe Bird Mound. This is near Cassville. Um, it is, uh, was donated by the Roe family. This is the Roe family in the 1950s. It's owned by the Mississippi Valley Conservancy and the DNR. And um, it is, was first mapped by Theodore Lewis in the late 1800s. Theodore Lewis was a mound surveyor who was based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. He mapped something like 15,000 mounds in his career. He was an incredible, incredible uh, person. And, and this is his map you can see here. So this was first mapped in the 1880s. This is a, a bird effigy that has a wingspan of about 270 feet and it still remains today. So here it is. You can see the bird in the circle here. This technology is called LIDAR. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a really excellent technology that allows us to paint out the vegetation and see really, really detailed topography. And so this effigy actually shows up on LIDAR, which is really excellent. Again, this is at the Cassville Bluff State Natural Area. And if any of you are interested in seeing effigy mounds, there's a couple of really excellent places that are publicly accessible near you. One is Wyalusing State Park and the other is Nelson Dewey um, State Park as well. Here's another example. This is the Raysback Mound Group. Um, this is uh, you know, on the Raysback property. There's something like 80 mounds here that were uh, first discovered, or, or I should say, um, you know, researched by the Milwaukee Public Museum in the 1930s. You can see there's, um, you know, birds flying off the edge. There's a series of conicals as well. And um, about, I mean, within the last 10 years, maybe 10 years ago, the then state archaeologist John Broyhan, who actually is from the Platteville area, and assistant state archaeologist Amy Roseboro, um, used LIDAR, used this imagery to um, further investigate the Raysback Mounds. And they actually found additional mounds by, again, using the LIDAR and then going to the property and walking over. And so they were able to um, help us to learn more about this particular site. This is a good example, again, of 
effigy mounds that are in the interior part of the driftless area. Um, mound building is a summertime activity. This tells us that people are probably stuck, <laughs> not, not wanting to be, but th there's so many people because the population explodes with the bow and arrow um, that you know people are in the interior part of the driftless uh, in the summertime because mound building is of course a summertime activity. I'm gonna pass it over to Ernie who's gonna wrap this up and then we'll take your questions. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so as the effigy mound is going on in Southern Wisconsin, down by St. Louis, the first city north of Mexico forms, and it's a place called Cahokia. Um, and this is the first place where you get uh, intensive corn farming, which supports a big population, uh, tens of thousands of people, don't know exactly how many, but it might be up to 50,000 is, is high estimates certainly 10,000, maybe 30,000 people, but lots and lots of people living together. With that many people, uh, there's a social organization that's very structured, it's a ranked society. So there's elite leaders who are religious leaders who, um, who oversee uh, the populace who are prim primarily corn farmers. Um, this is the Mississippian culture, and it begins at roughly a 1050 AD, uh, at Cahokia. And, and some of the things about, about, about Mississippi is that they build a new kind of mound. They build rectangular mounds that have flat tops called pyramidal mounds um, or platform mounds. The reason you have the platform mound is to put buildings on top. Uh, uh, and the largest one at Cahokia is called Monk's Mound. Uh, and so there's a temple or the leader of Cahokia lives up there. Uh, Monk's Mound is uh, 15 acres at the base. It's 100 feet tall. Uh, there's something like 25 million ba individual basket loads of earth that were used to build this thing. It was put up in a few years. Um, there's distinctive kinds of new pottery, painted pottery, and polished pottery. Arrowheads become very, uh, very elaborate, sharp, try not to project the points. Um, and this is a new kind of pottery that comes in about 1100 AD. Uh, there's artisans who make uh, wonderful statues and, and as well as the pottery. Um, and as I mentioned, there's corn farmers, there's hoes and things like that that appear for the first time. Um, there's things called wood hinges at Cahokia, where there, there's actually large posts that were put in the ground that mark the solstices and the equinoxes. And so they could, they could predict when those events would happen or mark when they happened. And then the leader could tell people, well, it's time to plant the corn now. It's time to have a certain ceremony this time of year um, and things like that. So, so they, they control the society. Um, it's a brand new thing and it's going on while the effigy mounds are happening up here towards the end of the effigy mounds. We know that from Cahokia at 1050 AD, right when it forms, there's a few people from Cahokia that come north all the way to Wisconsin, north of southern Wisconsin. So there's, a, there's an outpost at Trempolo that Danielle and I have been working at uh, for the past 10 years or, or 15 years or so. Um, and I'm not going to go into that story here much, but we have a book that Danielle will talk about at the very end that, that tells that story. But, but people came 530 miles up the Mississippi River and established, they built pyramidal mounds, platform mounds. They brought their pots with them. These are pots that were made in Cahokia and found at Trempolo. Uh, they brought their stones with them. They brought their whole culture with them. And they established a mini culture, a mini Cahokia, I'm sorry, at Trempolo. Lasted about 20 years and then it vanished. We don't know why. There's a there's a smaller one near Stoddard called the Fisher Mound Site, Com Site Complex. With, that's what this FMSC is. And then there's a little bit of stuff at the, the site of Astaland, Astaland State Park in southwestern Wisconsin. Begins about that time. But that's really a late woodland village that Mississippians come to um, and, and uh, begin to change it. Um, after 1100 AD, there's a whole bunch of Mississippian stuff that comes north from Cahokia. And all of these blue dots represent sites uh, where there's a, this new kind of pottery called, called uh, Ramian size. It's very highly decorated. Um, it's a time marker. And they, all these sites have Ramian size on them. Um, and one of those sites is the Fred Edwards site in Grant County, which I'm going to talk about next. So this is the Fred Edwards site. It was excavated by UW Madison, Jim Stoltman, um, and Fred Finney in the mid 1980s. Um, 
And uh, it's, it's in the interior of the Grant River Valley, uh, about nine miles from the Mississippi River. Um, Mississippians built rectangular or square houses, very different from that the wigwam type structure that Danielle showed you. Um, and this is uh, on the right, the photograph shows you the posts were of, of a rectangular building with internal storage pits and such. Um, they found, uh, I think, 14 or so of these houses in their excavations. Um, this was also a palisaded village. So in the map on the lower right, you see this line of posts here. That's part of a wall, a fortification wall. So it's a defensive place. They felt threatened if they were not attacked. Um, and these are this is this Ramian sized pottery that's from uh, the Fred Edwards site. So um, really unique site uh and uh it, it, it it's 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 kind of special um but it's a woodland village that blends mississippian uh different from trouble which is pure mississippian a little later in time so this is more like as to life um there's another mississippian expression south of the wisconsin river called the gotchall rock shelter and this is this is a site that has mississippian paintings on the wall um, this is a photograph of the outside of the sandstone shelter. Bob Salzer from Beloit College worked at Gotchall for almost 15 or 20 years or so. And he's pointing to, to, uh, to paintings on a wall. Um, and in the upper right, this is what those paintings look like. So it's, 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 there's actually another human down below, but there's uh, three humans here that have tattoos on them. Uh, they've got sunbursts on their forehead. There's their chains dangling down. There's a animal hanging from that chain, a dead animal. He's holding a bundle or something. There's a turtle-like animal above him. Um, and this uh, human figure here has another sunburst with a chain coming down. Um, and in front of him is a big thunderbird-like animal with a forked die. He has a forked die as well. These are classic Mississippian iconographic styles. Um, archaeologists uh, almost immediately recognize that this has similarities to a Ho-Chunk story called the story of Redhorn, in which Redhorn uh, battles some giants. Um, and I can't find my cursor again, but... Uh, Thanks. Um, this, so this, supposedly this is Redhorn and he battles these giants and Redhorn is aided by uh, a Thunderbird called Storms as he walks and Turtle. Um, so the, the, the idea was that this is, a, this is a rendition of the story of Redhorn, which was recorded in the early, 19, early 1900s. Um, but this is a thousand year old painting. So, so if this is the Red Horn story, that story goes back a thousand years in southwestern Wisconsin. Um, this is that panel. Uh, there's the turtle. Uh, there's the sunburst of one of the humans, the other one here. Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry. Um, but when unfortunately the Gotcha Rock Shiller became well known and made National Geographic in 1984, and that winter somebody snuck in and tried to sut, cut away. Um, with a mason saw, Redhorn, this is Redhorn inside, there's his arm and his head. So they tried to steal Redhorn from this panel and they didn't get away with, they didn't, weren't able to remove it, but they scarred, there's storms as he walks, uh, scarred. And it's just vandalism and rock art is a problem. Um, and that happened at Gotchall Rock Shelter. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. Uh, the last culture, archaeological culture in, in, in southern Wisconsin is called the Oneota culture. And there's no Oneota in southern Driftless area. So what we have here is a series of maps that show this is the Epigy Mound culture that Daniel talked about, the packed landscape. And so you get Epigy Mounds all into the interior valleys. And this is after the bow and arrow. You begin to get a little bit of hor corn horticulture. Um, but uh, uh, so, so people are occupying this whole area, the Raysbeck groups in through here, and there's all sorts of effigy mounds all through here. Um, when Cahokia begins at 1050 in the Fred Edwards site, what happens is the effigy mound people abandon this area. There's no other sites in this whole area other than Fred Edwards. There's one in northeastern Iowa called the Hartley Fort, and then you get Aslan off to the east, and you get things up to the north, but there's nobody apparently living in here beginning at 1050 AD. And then when Oneota happens after 1150 AD, there's Oneota sites at Red Wing, there's Oneota sites at La Crosse, there's Oneota sites in eastern Wisconsin, but there's no Oneota sites in through here. So it appears that the, the Driftless area, the center of the Driftless area, is abandoned for from about a thousand years ago or from 1100 years, 1100 AD until European contact. And we don't know why that is, but there's, there's just no Oneota villages in this whole area. So this is 
the beginning of the French contact period. Marquette and Joliet come down in 1673. This map is sideways. It gets, I mean, it's upright, but north is to the right here. So they come down Green Bay. They go by Lake Winnebago. They go up the Fox River to Portage, and they come down the Wisconsin River to the Mississippi River, and then they work their way south. And what they mark is this area that we're talking about today is, I can't speak French, but that's as uninhabited. There's nobody living in this area in 1673. This is an 1829 map, shoot, sorry, of the same area. I mean, of, of, this is the lead district in 1829. Here's the Wisconsin River, Mississippi River, and it shows the, 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 the lead mines that are, that are happening, the early lead mines, but also the red dots are all Ho-Chunk villages going up the Rock River and into the, this is the, the Madison Lakes area and then the lower Wisconsin River. So this whole area is surrounded by Ho-Chunk villages from that time period. And in 1829 was the first, there was the treaty that that's, was signed with the Ho-Chunk where they gave up the south part of the Wisconsin River so that the, 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 the American settlers would stay out of the northern part of the Wisconsin, north of the Wisconsin River, which is where the Ho-Chunk were supposed to have land forever until the Black Hawk War happened. So I think that's what I, I have. And then I'm going to turn it back to Danielle again. <laughs> So that is a whirlwind summary of the, you know, early archaeological, you know, human occupation of the Southern Driftless. Um, if you were looking for further resources, um, there's a really excellent resource called um, Wisconsin First Nations, and I have the website listed here. And it's just a great resource if you're interested in learning more about the tribes of Wisconsin. And um, it's just full of you know books and maps and um you know pbs documentaries and it's a really really excellent portal for more information about native americans in wisconsin um the other thing we didn't talk much about because we were focusing on the southern driftless uh if you're getting antsy and you want to get outside and hike a free trail uh we would encourage you to check out tremptrip.com. This is uh, the website for the Trempolo Interpretive Path that Ernie mentioned. This is a project we worked on um, really since uh, almost every summer since 2010, but we, we worked in Trempolo um, going back um, early into the 90s and me in the early 2000s. But essentially the, the Trempolo Interpretive Path is a series of three interconnected exhibits. This is one of them, the Little Bluff Trail Mound. So we worked with a trail builder. There used to be nothing here um, and, and, um, and cut this uh, path up to the bluff top and it overlooks the Mississippi River looking down, you know, towards uh, La Crosse. It's a really excellent, um, nice little trail, plenty of ample free parking. And then there's a series of interpretive um, signs as you walk. On the other side of this kiosk, there's a sort of, it, it orients you to the trail. And then I believe the, the, the other venues, there's one where there's artifacts on display at the Shirley M. Wright Memorial Library in Trempolo um, that are free to see. And then the third venue is at Perot State Park, the 2000 square foot nature center there. We, we redid the exhibits there. Um, however, I believe that remains closed because of the coronavirus restrictions still, but hopefully that'll open back up um, in, the, in the summer months. So, just something to think about if you're looking for something to do. It's a nice free um, outdoor trail to check out. At that, at this point, I mean, we're happy to open up uh, questions. And um, again, we have if we have our website listed, and you can always reach us if you have more um, questions at info at driftlesspathways.com. Uh, if you want information about the archaeology, uh, we have uh, several books that we have for sale on the website too. So. We are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, you've got a lot of uh, questions lining up here. Uh, we'll go ahead and start off. And if you've got a question, please go ahead and type it out now in the Q&A. Uh, Don Millman, who's calling in from North Carolina, asks, uh, have the Abigee Mounds in Peniel Church area been formally documented? You know, uh, I don't know. 
probably, but I don't know. I, most of the effigy mounds have been documented, but not all of them. I don't know specifically about those. And, and so we, we would have to check on that. Um, but just to give you an idea, Daniel mentioned the, the Raysbeck group that the LIDAR showed. Uh, we, we found, John and Amy found new mounds at, uh, at Raysbeck with the LIDAR. I did a project in the Bad Axe River Valley where we found 40, no, 40 new mounds based on LIDAR too. There are mounds out there that have not yet been documented. Greg Tipsword asks, were Buffalo a part of the economy and the driftless? He's read historical accounts of large numbers of Buffalo in the Boscobel area. Yes, and actually um, at the Broglie Rock Shelter, there was bison bone found, which is really interesting um, because it's pretty far uh, east for, for bison in the, in the, especially in South. Um, but absolutely, bison were incredibly important at different periods of time, um, particularly during the what, what archaeologists call the Oneota culture. That's the period of time right before the French arrive. Um, so from about 1300 to about 1650, um, people are relying quite heavily on, on bison. Uh, Bonnie Penno asks, was there trade in the Clovis period? Uh, we don't know, possibly. It, it, the, the distribution of raw materials, so Hickston solidified sandstone, for example, Clovis points made out of Hickston solidified sandstone have been found as far away as Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. Um, was that traded there or did people roam that far? We don't know. Um, it's probable, I mean, people were more nomadic early on in terms of they were just, they were moving across the landscape, the, the first people in this area, the Clovis people, and, and uh, they, whether they, they probably carried that stuff more so those distances, but it's possible they began trading that early. You know, one thing that's so, interesting about paleo Indian is that it's pretty ephemeral on the landscape. So there's, um, you know, we get the stone tools, but of course we don't get the wooden shafts that they don't preserve. We have very little information about other kinds of the material culture, like what houses look like. Um, you know, really they're, they're not making pottery. So we have no real evidence of that. So to find paleo Indian sites is, is somewhat difficult um, and to make sense of them and to try to put those puzzle pieces together when you only have just a small trace um, is really, really tough. It's an excellent question. Um, and it's one that I don't know that we, we know for sure. Um, but presumably the, the, the movement of materials like stone tool material from Wisconsin to far reaches, um, at least tells you that people are traveling here, if not trading. The, the, just to add a quick comment. So at Withington side, you have Hickston's list by sandstone points. Those are probably carried there by the people. Who, so from Withington, at one point, they go up to, they go up to Silver Mound, they obtain some stone, and they, and they either make points there or they bring some stone with them and, and finish it off at the Withington site. The, the North Dakota material, the, the Knife River Flint, that may have been, that's more like, the, if anything was traded, that one probably could have been. But the, but the other one, the Gray Flint from Southern Illinois probably was carried up as well. So the, the idea is that these people moved a long way on foot um, or by canoe uh, very early on. Jessica Hermsen asks if you could say a few words about the Fred Edwards site. So we touched upon Fred Edwards, and that's located in the lower Grand River Valley. That is a thousand-year-old site, AD 1100 to 1200 is what it dates to, and there's lots of radiocarbon dates from it. Uh, it's a village site that, um, uh, it, it was a woodland village site that Mississippian people came to, uh, and, and so there's a blend, the pottery is blended. You get Mississippian pottery, you get woodland pottery, and you get blended pottery. You get, you get Mrs. Woodland pottery or Woodland Sippy pottery. So it's, it's the beginning of, of the, the blending of woodland and Mississippian. And out of that is what may become Oneota after that period of time. Um, but so, yeah, that's, so Fred Edwards is, it's a, it's a crucial site. It's also 
unlike Trempolo, it's tucked way back in the valley, like the Hartley Fort site is, and there's a palisaded, like Aztalan is on the Crawfish River in eastern Wisconsin, palisaded villages in remote settings. Trempolo, 50 years before that, is out on the superhighway. There's no palisades. There's no defense. So something happens at 1100 AD. The world changes to go from a peaceful thing to just to a, a threatened environment. Yeah, Fred Edwards is really interesting because it it's there all of the material culture, as Ernie said, is is blended. So it's clearly people intermarrying, or um, maybe you know whether it's debatable whether people are there on their own or are they captives or what's happening. But there's clearly um, different cultural groups of people coming together, and when that happens, you start to see blending in the way. They make things. It makes perfect sense. And Fred Edwards is a really important site at that period of time. Um, and it happens to be in Grant County. So it's it's um, it, probably one of the highlights of this of the archaeology in the Southern Driftless. Kate Cazziol asks, uh, where is the Osceola site uh, with relation to Castville? She owns some uh, bluff top land there. It has a couple of documented conical mounds. She was wondering if they might be related to the Osceola sites. So, so Osceola is on the is on the, the banks of the Mississippi River. So it's on a sand terrace down on the on the Mississippi River floodplain area or overlooking the floodplain. Uh, before the lock and dams, actually, there was a substantial bit of floodplain between that and the main channel of the Mississippi River. So um, it's it's in the Grant River. Uh, recreation area. The Corps of Engineers owns and manages it now, so it's down. That's where it's at. But in terms of the the conical mounds, um, you know, those are um, you see lots of conical mounds on the bluff tops in that area. And so, um, I mean, it, great for her that she recognizes them. Um, and there's all sorts of programs that you can get. You know, the tax credit for um, you know maintaining that part of your land if you own it. Um, and not, you know, not building on it, et cetera. So hopefully she knows about those things too. The, the Conica Mons are probably slightly later than the Osceola, Osceola. site itself. Osceola is like the end of the archaic and, and there may be some beginning of mounds being built at the very end of the archaic, but, but the Conica Mons are, are probably middle woodland, uh, maybe 500 years later. Okay, great answer. Okay, David Allen asks if you could recommend some books that contain the information you're sharing today. Maybe you could say a few words more about the, the titles that you, you yourselves have written. Sure, yeah, on our website, um, you can get copies of these books. Um, a really good entertaining book that's a, a kind of a survey of exactly what we just talked about is called 12 millennia the archaeology of the upper mississippi river valley and that was a book that ernie wrote with jim thieler um who it was a faculty member at uw madison and they the two of them um did their graduate work at madison and spent um, most of their careers at uw lacrosse and it's it, the book is written for a general public, so that's a really excellent resource if you just want to, you know, more information about that. Um, if you're interested in identifying your projectile points, a lot of farmers um, are, or maybe you've, you know, you're a farm family and you've inherited points from your family. Um, Ernie wrote a book um, called A Projectile Point Guide. Um, for the Upper Mississippi River Valley, that's also available on our website. It's a really good resource for helping you figure out, you know, how old things are and what kind of materials they're made of. Um, and then there are two books on rock art. And as you mentioned, Eric, one of them won the Midwest Book Award. It's a book that Ernie wrote with Jerry Schraub called Hidden Thunder. It's a really, really beautiful um, coffee table type book that explores rock art, the carvings and paintings, Indian carvings and paintings um, in this region. Uh, and it explores this from three perspectives, from an archeological perspective, that's Ernie, um, from an artistic perspective, that's Jerry. She has her beautiful watercolors of the rock art sites. And then also from a Native American perspective. So each chapter is a different rock art site in Wisconsin. And it's three different voices kind of throughout. Um, and so that's that's another option. And then 
we have a series called Beneath Your Feet. And that's a, a, a book about the archaeology at Trumplow. That's been our most recent research. And then finally, there's another book called Deep Cave Rock Art. That is um, another book on rock art. So. Wonderful. I look forward to uh, adding copies of those to my library. It sounds, they all sound wonderful. Uh, uh, William Robichaud asks, uh, given the widespread adoption of the bow and arrow throughout the world, is there an estimation of how many times it was independently invented in cultures around the world? Excellent question. Five. I <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. will. <laughs> Um, so, so it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, the bow and arrow based on arrowheads, uh, when they come into this area is roughly 750 AD, the bow and arrow appears in West in Southwestern Wisconsin. Um, it seems like it's spread into this area, diffused into this area from the plains and maybe up into the Arctic, uh, you know, pretty rapidly. Um, and, and, uh, so you, you see arrow bow and arrow up and, and going up to the Arctic circle, uh, somewhat before that, and, and once you get to the Arctic Circle, people are pretty much living around the pole. And, and so the Inuit or Eskimo culture, that, that it's circumpolar. So, so the bow and arrow probably goes around the pole, which then takes you to Siberia and back to Europe and, and such. Um, but I, you know, I can't tell you about, I don't, I don't even like know if they have bow and arrow in, in Australia. Um, it's I don't think they had like it. So, yeah, so I, but it goes it goes back much earlier in Africa and and Asia and Europe, Europe and, and such. So um, it came out of the old world up to the Arctic Circle and spread into the New World, and and down into Wisconsin by 750 D. Independent invention? Why? I don't know. It could be. I mean, there are you know, in terms of rock art, you see um, universal symbols, uh, you know, across the world, uh, and so you know there clearly there are some some inventions that are occurring um you know independently across the world and you know throughout human history and in terms of the bow and arrow i mean i would not be surprised if that's the case i just i can't give you an exact number <laughs> but it's a good question there's a good question shirley asks wasn't a statue found at the gushaw rock shelter Yes. A sandstone um, carving um, of a human head was found at, at um, Gottschall. And I believe it, was it painted as well? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's about eight inches tall. Uh, and the facial expressions, the, the, the carving is, is nothing spectacular like you see these ones down at Gokia, but it's painted. There's a series of vertical lines and then an oval right at the chin. Um, and and it's, it's like a tattooed face. And you see that same kind of decoration in, in other paintings down by Cahokia uh, and, and elsewhere. There's actually a painting up by La Crosse that may have uh, vertical stripes painted on the face as well. So yes, there was a, a, a statue, sandstone statue found at Gacha Raksha. It's called Mr. Head. Uh, Chris Marion says, uh, I live in Blanchardville in Lafayette County. What would be a good book to read to understand her area? I mean, I think the archaeology of the Upper Mississippi River Valley would, would be good. I mean, 12, 12 millennia is, uh, yeah, it, it, it covers the Driftless area. There's no book specifically for uh, your, for the Blanchardville area, um, but, but uh I mean, there's, there's sites everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you want to zero in on a like, particular valley or a particular region, then, you know, uh, there's, you just kind of need to, I mean, we can help you identify things and researchers, people who live in Blanchardville area who have collections and, and we've documented some of those. There's some on, there's some at local museums. As a matter of fact, I did, um, I, I love Blanchardville, by the way. I did a project um, with the Blanchardville Historical Society and also with their library. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so definitely check out the, the little museum they have in town. They, it's just been renovated within the last couple of years. Um, and they're a good resource definitely for, um, you know, sort of early contact historic era 
they have lots of references um, at the at the Blancherville Museum. They do have a stone artifact collection too, stone tools. Um, but yeah, I think that when you start looking at particular areas, if there's something you know in particular that you're looking for, just drop us a line. We're happy to try to point you in the right direction. Uh, John Heasley asked if there's any evidence to support the idea that effigy mounds are astronom excuse me, astronomically aligned to sun, moon, and stars. Uh, he's wondering especially about the Shadwald uh, Mound group on Franks Hill in Richland County near Muscadet. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, there's 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 uh, there's been quite a bit of work done to look for astrological astronomical alignments uh, of effigy mounds and lots of other things. So Cahokia, there's wood hinges, there's astronomical alignments at Trumbull, there's things that line up to the equinoxes and the solstices and such like that in the Mississippi time period. Effigy mounds, um, there's been some studies that have suggested there are alignments. There have been other studies that have suggested there are not alignments. Um, and, and so there's so many effigy mounds uh, that, that if you look hard enough, you're gonna find an alignment because they're, they're, you know, they, they cover the whole compass. Frank's Hill is, is a, it's an interesting group. It runs along the crust of a hill. Mm -hmm. So is the alignment there, if it aligns with something like an equinox or solstice because they're meant to do that, or is it because the hill just happens, they're on the crust of that hill, you know, the hill happens to naturally align with that sort of thing. We don't know for sure. One thing that's interesting about effigy mountain groups is that they tend to be oriented by the worldview. So a lot of times you will get like bird mounds above bear mounds and then, you know, lower world mounds below bear mounds. And so you're seeing that they're aligned on the landscape that way, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I have no doubt in my mind that um, the that native people for and people forever and you know, across the world have have um, paid very very close attention to the movement of the stars, the sun, and the moon. It is an integral part of being human, and there is no doubt in my mind that um, that extends back to the beginning of time. Um, and so. Uh, you know, we, it's well documented. If you look at oral tradition too, there's lots of stories about um, the stars and the sky, the night sky, and the changes that you see through time are really tied to certain kinds of ceremonies and activities that take place at different times of the year. So no doubt in my mind that, um, you know, during the effigy mound period, people are paying attention, whether or not they're, you know, aligned astronomically, I, it could be, I don't think anybody has, like Ernie said, once you start looking at alignments, um, it can get tricky because everything starts to be able to line up with something, so. There, there's an argument, the, the, the uh, Effigy Miles National Monument in Northeastern Iowa, there's a famous group called the Marching Bear Group, and the, and the, the the superintendent at FG Mounds, uh, the current one, it, it, you know, he's done a lot of research, and he he sees that that is a map of the Big Dipper, you know, which is which is which is a bear kind of symbolism type thing. So, I don't know. Could it could be? <laughs> okay, oh, that's very interesting. Um, William Robichaud asks, how far does the archaeological or historical evidence go um, of the Ho Chunk presence in the Driftless? Mm, a great question. If you say to Hoch, if you ask Hochamp about their own history and their own deep connection to this land, they'll say forever, um, since the beginning of time. Um, archaeologically, I think it's, I think we would both say that um, as you get back further in time, as you go deeper in time, it gets more and more difficult to say with, with certainty that the material culture we're finding is tied to any modern day group. That's why archaeologists have come up with these terms to when they start to see patterns of, you know, what the material culture looks like and then changes, we come up with a new name, you know, that's sort of like a culture. But how that relates to modern day tribes, 
it gets a little tricky. Um, certainly, uh, when the French arrive in the first written records, Ho-Chunk people are here. Um, Ho-Chunk people are probably related to what archaeologists call the Oneota culture. That's people living in these large village sites. They're corn farmers. They're here about 1300 AD. Um, and probably late woodland as well, probably the woodland culture. As you extend further back 5,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, it gets really, really difficult. And what you start to do is you piece together the archeology, span the oral tradition, the ethnography, you look at language, um, language groups of modern people. And then another part of this is DNA study, right? Analysis, however, that requires a level of destruction of human bone. And that gets really tricky um, because of course, some native people don't want to see um, their ancestors, um, you know, their bones, um, you know, destroyed for the purposes of, of science. So, um, you know, I think more and more there are native people be getting into archaeology. For example, the, the Ho-Chunk Nation has a tribal historic preservation officer. His name is Bill Quackenbush. Um, they have a, a whole department of people who, um, I mean, Ernie and I have worked with Bill for a number of years. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really become where it has to be like a mutual partnership to understand, you know, what do, what do Ho-Chunk want to see happen? This is, you know, in terms of their ancestors. So, I mean, it's, it's a delicate issue and it's, it's tough to say, as I said, with a level of certainty, once you get back more than a thousand years, that's what I would say. Ernie, I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, well, uh, um, how much time you got? <laughs> so, um, but so just, I mean, if you look at the historical record, which is one aspect of this, the written historical record, the French and the English, um, the, I think the first time you, you, you have mention of the whole chunk inhabiting the Driftless area is in the late 1700s. It's the first time you see it. So Jonathan Carver is after the French Indian War, come, 1766, comes down the Wisconsin River, and he and he writes, you know, some information. He talks about Sock and Fox at Prairie du Chien, um, the outer, outer gaming village there. So um, doesn't mention Ho Chunk after you leave Lake Winnebago area sort of thing. Um, but there's, you know, there's, 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 I don't know, there's just, there's not a lot of written record there. Um, uh, on the other hand, Nicholas Perot, 1685. Comes down, the Miss, comes down the Wisconsin River to the Mississippi River, and he goes up to Trampolo, and he's looking to meet the Iowa tribe. And, and he's guided by Ho-Chunk. So they know this area, and, they, and, the, and, the, and the Ho-Chunk and the Iowa are related tribes. They're brother tribes. They speak the same language. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so the Ho-Chunk guides certainly know in 1685, the Wisconsin River, all the way, how, how do you find the Iowa in 1685? Ho-Chunk can take you there. So, you know, it's, it, there's no known villages or recorded villages till late, but the Ho-Chunk certainly are going through this area. And, and, and the Ho-Chunk come from Oneota, who came from Effigy Mound, who came from Hopewell, who came from Archaic, who came from Paleo Indian. So, you know, but so did a whole bunch of other people. So did a whole bunch of other tribes. Okay, it sounds like this is a deep topic. It's very, it's really complicated and fascinating, I think. Okay, uh, Jeff uh, Teal says that he enjoyed your presentation so much that he wished you had even more time to speak. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Or people like that who wish they could uh, hear you speak more. Obviously, now they know about your books. Uh, but uh, tell us, could you say a few words about the, some of the field trips that you lead and uh, how they might learn more about those field trips if and when they're offered again in the future? Yeah, we do um, tours to archaeological sites in the Driftless area and beyond. Um, we work really closely with NRF, the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin, and we so we partner with them and offer field trips for them. We offer field trips through Driftless Pathways as well. So if you want to, you know, see some of these sites up close and personal, um, you know, get a, get in touch with us and we'll, you know, talk about it and, and figure out what might work, check out NRF, the Natural Resources Foundation website, um, and you can sign up for tours that we offer for them directly with them as well. So, um, you know, sometimes we do private tours through uh, Driftless Pathways. Sometimes there are groups who 
you know, maybe it's a hiking club and they have 10 people and they, they are interested in rock art or something and they'll contact us and we'll just do a tour for that particular group. So we have scheduled tours that, you know, are scheduled now through October. And then we also will offer tours on an as, you know, needed basis when we, you know, get inquiries for people. So uh, it's something we really, really enjoy doing. If you haven't guessed, we're really passionate about what we do. Our hope is to do the best we can in sharing this really, really incredible um, story of human adaptation with people as often as we can. I mean, we, we do research, but we do it so we can share it with you, with all of you. So thank you so much for um, listening to us. <laughs> Yeah, your passion and expertise do come through. And in fact, maybe we'll have to talk about possibly uh, scheduling a field trip um, with uh, uh, the audience of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum sometime. It'll be fun to hear what our viewers think about that possibility. Mary Huck asks, uh, how did the bow and arrow arrive in Southwest Wisconsin? Well, it, it was... So the bow and arrow is a, is, a, is a, if you think about an arms race, the bow and arrow is a technological revolution. So you can get, you get more shots more accurately, carrying less weight. And, and, uh, and so it changes how people hunt. It also changes how people do warfare. Um, so, so whoever has the bow and arrow, if you're in conflict with someone else, they need to get the bow and arrow pretty quick as well. So, so it, once, so once it comes in, people probably uh, adopt it pretty quickly. quickly. They learn how to do it be, because you have to. Um, and, and so it seems to spread probably from the West across the plains into Wisconsin about 750 AD. We don't know exactly, uh, but, but very rapidly it sweeps across all of Eastern North America. Um, and they, and they, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's, oh, no, please. Well, well, they pretty much stopped using the spear at that point. The mm -hmm. bone, the bear, once the bow and arrow comes in, spears are pretty much obsolete. Okay, wow, that abruptly. Pretty much. Same thing when, when muskets come in. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. I suppose that makes sense. Now, Shelly Olson... Uh, is writing and she says she is the daughter of Fred Edward and she says her, huh. her sister is watching too so so, so okay. nice to have you both. Uh, okay. Shelly asks uh, did she understand correctly that there wasn't any Native American inhabitation since the Fred Edwards site? So so I mean yeah it's pretty much that's the last known odd occupied village until historic times in most of the driftless area. So there's, there's, there's no Oneota sites, which is the, which is the period of time from, from 1200 AD until 1650 when the French arrived, the Midwest is occupied by Oneota people. And, but they're in, they're, they're not in the Southern driftless area. There's a few Oneota shirts at Prairie du Chien, but the area, the only no one is living here is probably hunting territory. People are probably coming in to visit Oneota. People are probably coming down this way into your, you know, that area and, and, and on hunting excursions and such. But, but the Oneota Oni are, are farmers and they're settling in big villages uh, with lots of people. Uh, and, and, and they're at, like up at La Crosse and up at Red Wing and down in Apple River to south of you, uh, there's Oneota villages. Um, and then they're going on buffalo hunts uh, in the wintertime out to the prairies and then they come back to their summer villages. But that's just, there's no known villages after Fred Edwards in the Southern Driftless area. Yeah, Fred Edwards, as I said um, earlier, is one of the most important sites in the Southern Driftless in terms of our understanding of, of you know, a period of time about 900 years ago. And, um, you know, the collections from the site are, are pretty remarkable. They are curated at UW-Madison. I used to care for them <laughs> when I worked at UW-Madison. Um, it might be kind of interesting to think about, um, you know, working with them to get a loan of some of that, um, those artifacts to come on exhibit maybe as part of, you know, as you think about new exhibits at the um, Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum, nice. um, because it, it really is important um, in terms of our understanding of, of that period of time. 
just real quick to, to add it, what it seems to happen is that when you, when you have effigy mounds all over the place, when effigy mound winds down and you, tr and you, you transition to Oneota because of the Mississippian influence, the populations just nucleate. They come together, all the people come together to these big Oneota villages and they become Oneota. Uh, but it's, there's just, for some reason, there's no Oneota villages in the Driftless area, in that part of the Driftless area. Okay, it sounds like there's lots of um, research into the whys of that subject matter, and my, uh, my questions are really spinning here. Um, let's move forward. John asks, uh, if, if uh, people who are viewing today would be able to have a copy of the presentation, then may I simply say that uh, later this week, um, museum staff will make a recording of this uh, presentation available for uh, people who, who have tickets for this. And so everyone will receive a link uh, to, to that in, via email. So stay tuned for that later in the week. Jim Cerro asks, are you aware of, or have you heard of the Cerro Rock Shelter? C-E-R-R-O. Oh, boy. Um, it doesn't ring a bell, but it sounds sort of familiar. It does I, sound I, familiar. I, I couldn't tell I you couldn't what it is. I couldn't place it. So okay. there's a lot of yeah. Okay, fair enough. But um, um, you should get in touch with us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, info at driftlesspathways.com. Yeah. If yeah. you have, want to share over some more information on that, Jim. Martin. And we, we can check to see if it's recorded, too. The state has a database of recorded archaeological sites. There's lots of sites that are not yet known, and this may very well be one. But if it is known, if you, just because we don't remember it, could you know could be that it's recorded, too. So. And then we can tell you about what we know. Martin and Judy ask, how does one go about finding out if there's a mound on their property? Hmm. Yeah, so um, we get, you know, inquiries about that. Um, people say, I think I have a mound on my property. Sometimes we'll ask people to, you know, maybe send us a photograph. And mounds are very difficult to photograph at different times of the year. Um, sometimes we'll, you know, make a site visit. Uh, the State Historical Society has their state archaeologists. You can also inquire with them. But again, what we would do is we would start by looking at Wisconsin has a, an archaeological site database that it's restricted access because it has pretty sensitive information about you know specific places of where archaeological sites are so um, they don't usually allow like just open public access but if you provided us the information about you know maybe where your property is located generally we can look there, that's where we start. We start there to see is something known, has something been recorded? Um, and as Ernie said, it doesn't mean that you don't have a mound on your property, it just means that it, it's not recorded, so. We can also check LIDAR. Oh yeah, and we can, and LIDAR now is a really excellent source for finding mounds too. But ultimately it might involve, a, uh, it probably would involve a, a, an in-person visit to verify it. Um, and uh, if it's not already recorded, or if you can't make sure it's on LIDAR, if you think you have a mound, uh, oftentimes it involves coming to see the, the, the feature then, and then uh, assessing it in the field. Okay. Um... Let's see, we have a viewer who says in parts of the country, there's more and more evidence of earlier habitation in North America. Uh, what's your perspective on that? And is there a discussion of that in the Driftless area? Yeah, so um, there's there's a interesting thing happening um, in archeology span in the like academic sense and the research field. Um, they're about, this has been going on for, I would say, about 20 years, and there, is, there are sort of two schools of thought. Um, one is something that's called Clovis First, and that is a group of scientists, archaeologists, who think that um, the Clovis people, the people who make those, you know, Paleo-Indian people who make those distinctive stone points with the flute taken out, believe very, very strongly that they are the first people who inhabited, um, you know, what is now North America, right? Um, and what is now Wisconsin. Um, and the data would support that theory. Um, there are other people, there's another group of people who have spent their life 
um, looking for evidence of people having arrived um, into what is now, you know, the United States prior to Clovis times. And my concern with that is that, um, you know, people are, are trying to find the next big thing and they want to be, it, it starts to get where it's more about um, them finding something really cool and really new and, and early that it becomes, you start to see things get kind of stretched a little bit. And so, you know, I, it becomes more doubtful, I should say. So, you know, Ernie and I are probably in the camp of um, the evidence points to a Clovis first model, meaning the first people that were here are, are the Clovis people. Could there be people here before? Absolutely. But what we would need to verify that are very um, accurate radiocarbon dates and really good context and evidence from a scientific perspective of the stratigraphy, right? So we should see Clovis and we should see you know, underneath that, another occupation of people. And so far, um, we would argue that that just hasn't been, that hasn't been documented in a way that we would call there's a smoking gun, right? That you know for a fact that, you know, it's clearly, clearly evident. Um, on the other hand, there are, you know, some archeologists who are adamant that indeed there was a group of people here before Clovis. It is, if you want to get a bunch of archaeologists in a fight at the bar, you just, <laughs> you just bring this up and, uh, and it'll be uh, a quite an interesting conversation. So people feel very strongly about this. <laughs> okay, I'd like to be there for that conversation. That sounds interesting. <laughs> Jessica Hermson asks uh, if you would please clarify uh, the relationship between the uh, Raysbeck group, if I'm saying that correctly, and uh, the Cahokia's. Uh, the Fred Edwards site. She's saying those sites aren't very far from each other. And was it correct that uh, one group had left the area before the Cahokias came to Fred Edwards site? Um, so uh, they are very near each other. And in fact, uh, Amy uh, Roseboro, uh, just she, she did a LIDAR survey of the, of the Grant River Valley. Um, and she identified effigy mounds right around the Fred Edwards site itself, like literally across the fence line that hadn't been known before. She saw those on lighter. So there are effigy mounds, oh, a cluster right. of them right around the Fred Edwards site. Do they overlap in time or is there a 50 year difference? Not sure. Uh, uh, but at Fred Edwards, the woodland, the late woodland occupation at Fred Edwards is, is not a typical effigy mound. The pottery is not typically effigy mound. It's a little, it's slightly later in time where it might be the very, very, very end of effigy mound. Um, and, uh, and, and Jim Stoltman who excavated suggests that those people are actually coming in from central Illinois because the pottery is a little bit different. But um, it's, so maybe Fred Edwards is, is it's, it's a village that's, it, it's, it's the end, it's the, it's the last effigy mound people in the Drippus area. And then, and then Mississippians come there because they're still there. Uh, and they set up this palisaded village, but, but it's just, we don't know. We don't know for sure. Close, but maybe no cigars. Fair enough. I have a, a question for you. Uh, this is my own. And that is, um, I was excited to hear you speak a little bit about Harris Palmer who I've been learning about um, in our own museum's organizational research because he was uh, among the earliest members of the City of Platteville Museum Board. And uh, in addition to being a geologist, it sounds like uh, you know he's well known for his archeological work. And could you, you speak if, uh, if you know about a relationship between him, Harris Palmer, and Robert Nelson's Platteville Student Archeologists Group? Also regarding that, uh, Platteville student archaeologist was John uh, Broyhan, who's the state archaeologist now. Was was he one of uh, Nelson's students? I don't believe John Broyhan was. No, okay. but um, so Nelson actually learned some of his excavation techniques from Palmer. We call hmm. him Hap H A P Harris A Palmer, um, and so <laughs> we just Ernie and I are always. That's how a lot of archaeologists know him is Hap H A P. Um, but so Palmer was an interesting guy. I mean, he, um, 
he, as you said, you know, he was a geologist in Platteville. I think it was like a state normal school at the time, which is part of the UW system now, um, but really interested in archaeology. So he excavated a site called the XY um, Trading Post up in northern Wisconsin, kind of by um, um, like Spooner area-ish, Webster. Um, and so Bob Nelson uh, went on those excavations and kind of learned techniques from Palmer. So, yes, Silver oh yeah, they, they also excavated at Silver Mound, which is in, um, it's over by Hickston, Wisconsin, near Black River Falls. So Palmer and, and Nelson definitely connected and overlapped. So did Jim Stoltman and Harris Palmer. So Jim Stoltman was um, at the UW-Madison, and, um, and so he also was a, a conduit for Palmer when Palmer would ask, you know, he would ask questions and try to get input from Jim Stoltman and the State Historical Society. So Joan Freeman was involved in those conversations. So at the time, Joan Freeman was a state archaeologist. So yeah, there's lots of connections there. Um, in about like seven or eight years ago, I, um, well, even before that, in 2008, I got to know Bob Nelson and, um, and I actually met one of the, the Platteville student archeologists. Um, and so we, I engaged my students because at the time I was at UW-Madison. So I engaged my students in a, like a reanalysis of the collections. We recurated them. They weren't in like archival storage materials. And then we did some analysis of the collection. So we worked really closely with Bob. We, that, you saw the photos, we went back out to the site. Um, you know, worked with some cave mappers to map it again. And then um, I did a similar project with the Preston Rock Shelter. So I, I, there was a guy named Michael Roy who um, worked at UW-Madison in like something to not even related to archeology, span but he was a student of Palmer's at Platteville. And so I think the way he told it was he needed like six credits to graduate. <laughs> and so, he took Palmer's field school at the Preston Rock Shelter. And uh, in maybe 2012, and I could be getting my dates wrong, Michael Roy um, contacted me about the Preston Rock Shelter because again, at the time I was at UW-Madison, that's where the collections are curated. So Mike and I and Ernie, we went out to the site again. We um, you know, published a paper on Harris's work. We scanned all of his old documentation. So, um, you know, he's a really important figure in the Southern Driftless in terms of, of archaeology. We went to the, um, the Platteville archives, UW Platteville archives, to try to uncover old records of, of, of Harris. Um, and so, you know, got to learn a lot about his work. He did, he, you know, he wasn't formally trained as an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. um, but he did a lot of excavations. He did the best he could. And um, he was always reaching out to professionals for help. And so there's a definitely a really fascinating history um, with, with Palmer, Bob Nelson, Jim Stoltman, and others in Madison. So. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that time was maybe even before the subdiscipline of geoarchaeology, you know, was a, was a, a well-defined thing. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Well, fascinating. Palmer was, Palmer was very interested in early man. He was trying to find, that's why he dug Withington and he dug so deep into press and he was looking and he dug up at Silver Mount at Hickson where the fluted points came from at Withington. He was looking for the earliest people in Wisconsin. Mm. Well, and the members of our museum board and museum staff in uh, the 60s and, and 70s, it appears, were interested in rediscovering this evidence of early inhabitants of this region, not only uh, the mining cultures uh, of uh, Euro European and American descent, but they were, uh, our museum actually was leading archeological expeditions abroad uh, through individuals like Harris Palmer. It's been really interesting to rediscover that. Now, yeah. back to some of our uh, visitors we've got uh, here. Uh, we've got a Piper who is a current Platteville student of archeology. span uh, Piper asks if there's still research going on with the Robley Rock Shelter material. Yeah, I mean, I um, 
published a paper on it. And then some of my students did as well um, on the ceramics. So the, the pottery through time, the stone tools through time. There was an article done on the bison bone that was found there because it's just such a fascinating, um, interesting discovery. Um, and so that was done, you know, within the last maybe 10 or 12 years. As far as I'm aware, um, I don't know that anybody has looked at Broglie um, mo mo more recently. Um, again, those collections are curated at UW-Madison, so they'll always be there, um, you know, as new techniques come out, new analyses. Um, and so they, you know, they'll always be there if somebody wanted to look at something more specific. But. A lot of Palmer's collections were turned over to Jude Stoltman at UW-Madison in the 70s. Okay. And then, yeah, we can do like maybe one or two more questions. And then um, if we don't get to everybody's question, please feel free to contact us afterward and um, we do our best to try to answer. Okay, we'll take a couple of more then here. Um, Mark Haas, uh, who's uh, director for the Friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum, asks if there is a way for the public to easily access LIDAR imagery. And he says he's got a property that uh, Phil Milhouse um, visited with mounds that he didn't believe were documented. And he'd like to try to check out the LIDAR of his property. Apparently they're near the Fred Nelson site. Uh, so there, yes, there is publicly accessible LIDAR. Um, the Wisconsin DN, well, if you go to the state cartographer's office website, uh, you should be able to, to, to follow some links to the LIDAR data. Um, it's, it's a little difficult to get to. If you send us a message, I have a direct link, I can get it to you. Uh, but basically it's by counties and um, almost all the counties in Wisconsin now have LIDAR uh, post their, 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 their imagery posted on that website. Um, and basically it's at a five foot inter contour interval, um, which is usually too big to see mounds, but, but believe it or not, you can see lots of mounds on these things. Which, so you can, something that's as low as two feet high, you can, you can sometimes make out. LIDAR, the trick to LIDAR is that most of the, most of all the publicly accessible stuff is coming at a, at a sun angle from the Northwest. And, and there's, there's programs that you can change the sun angle digitally and, and, and mounds will come and go depending on the sun angle. So, so if you look at a parcel and you see a mound, that's great. But if you look at that same parcel and don't see a mound, if you change the light angle, there might be a mound there that could show up if you, if you manipulate it. And there's programs that allow you to do that, but it's, uh, that's getting pretty involved. But, but the initial thing is, yes, you can, you can look it up and you can see if there's one there. Uh, and again, we can check to see the site records or the state historic study can to see if there's already one reported. Phil may have very well have reported that site. Yeah, LIDAR is, is so awesome. But as Ernie said, it do, it requires like um, a, a computer that has a, a pretty hefty capacity like um, to process. And then a couple of programs like you can use QGIS as a program um, to, you know, put the LIDAR imagery in and then change the, the hill shade, um, the, the sun angle, basically. Yeah. Um, and so it's a little technical, but if, if you know, Ernie's Mr. LIDAR. So if you, if there was something particular you were interested in, um, you know, you could probably, you know, take a look at it. And then you always need to ground truth it, meaning you might see it on LIDAR, but to make sure unequivocally that it's a mound, we always then go to the property um, just to check it out in person as well. Fabulous. Okay, uh, uh, do you have time for one one more? The last one always buys us a beer, but sure. <laughs> okay, Marquette and Joliet's map show most of Southwest Wisconsin and Northwest Illinois is unoccupied in their 1673 map. So when did Native Americans begin re-inhabiting the area? Since uh, they clearly were here when the early lead miners arrived in the early 1800s. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. You know. After Marquette and Joliet, there, you know, there's there's a there's a break in time. Well, actually, before that, so uh, Nicolet comes in 1634, and then there's the the Iroquois War sort of blocked the French for 40 years, and then 
Marquette and Jolie come back in and they don't see anybody there, but, you know, but they they go down that river and turn left in about a couple of days. So it's not like they really explored it very much, but so they didn't, they didn't see anybody in their pass through. Um, Perot comes down and turns right, goes up the river. So if you look at the various accounts, uh, it's probably not until late 1700s and you get Julian Dubuque and he's meeting the Sauk and Fox and they're, they're, you know, trying to smelt lead, and and uh, and that that opens the On the other hand, you look if you look at Marquette and Juliet's map, they talk they talk about the the the, the French word for for lead, fear. What I can't remember what it is, but they almost like they recognize there's lead up in those hills or in this area. So so the resources identified right away, but the the sock fox are probably the first recognized tribe and that's over in northeast iowa but they're probably in this area as well and i mean it doesn't mean that people aren't entering the area but certainly it's unoccupied in terms of like larger village sites it's it's probable that people are coming in and out for certain things for resources um but it's, it's sort of like a no man's land concept where nobody lives here but it's okay if it, you go into that space for, you know, hunting or gathering or, you know, collecting some kind of resource as long as you don't stay. So it, it's sort of like a resource rich area buffer zone. Um, it, certainly there's no in when the front in the historic records, um, it's an area marked on the map where, you know, people aren't there aren't native people living. Um, at least that's what the records say. Prairie du Chien is a rendezvous place from the mid 1700s on. So, you know, people, Chippewa are coming from Lake Superior to Prairie du Chien. People come from hundreds and hundreds of miles to rendezvous at Prairie du Chien as a trade center. Okay. You know, so. Wow. Okay. I get the sense that we could really spend a long time exploring these topics more. Well, uh, how, how long have you spent uh, uh, thinking about these topics now? Some decades. Well, yeah, it's yeah, a long, long time. And it's um, really, really fascinating. I think that, you know, we are both from Wisconsin. And, you know, our want to be archaeologists always kind of um, had us wanting to study the archaeology of the area in which we grew up. You know, a lot of my friends were dreaming of going off to these distant lands. But I was always fascinated by you know, what, what's the story of people that were here before me, you know, and it's just a fascinating area the Driftless is a phenomenal place to live. Now, people have persevered and adapted um, with tremendous ingenuity through time. And it's just a really awesome story that is, you know, unique to different parts of the Driftless even. Um, just as we talked about the Southern Driftless today. So um, it's just a very unique area with a pretty awesome story to tell. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to tell it. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciated you sharing some of your time and your expertise with us today. Um, thanks to all who, uh, who attended and who shared their very interesting uh, questions. Um, you had many uh, additional compliments here that, that are shared in the Q&A fields. And, uh, and let, let us suffice to say that it, I think we've really struck, struck a nerve here where people are really interested in this concept of the pioneering spirit that goes back uh, well before the 1800s, um, you know, through the end of the last ice age. And I, I, I could not be more delighted, um, Danielle and Ernie, that we'll be able to work together here in the coming year as we work on interpreting some of that human history through uh, some of the extensive uh, museum uh, collections. Um, so it, I look put, uh, forward to connecting with you later in the, in the week and perhaps I'll leave you with this warm and fuzzy comment from Shelley, who says, please tell the presenters, thank you for explaining the significance of the Fred Edwards site to us because her father would have been so happy to have watched this. I don't think that as his family, we understood how important the site was as young girls, my two sisters, and I walked through the cornfield of that site with my dad looking for artifacts. We have fond memories of this time with my dad pursuing his hobby. So thank you. I finally remember Fred with his handlebar mustache. Wonderful man. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, we 
uh, invite everyone to tune in. Um, in the next two Sundays, we have the concluding two presentations for the Museum's Winter Lyceum Series. Next Sunday, uh, tune in when Platteville's own Mike Mayer will present Kai Ten, Japan's World War II human torpedo that stunned the US Navy. So we're gonna shift gears and move into the 20th century a little bit. Um, and so uh, feel free, if uh, you haven't already registered, visit our website uh, and sign up for our newsletter so you can uh, be sure to stay in touch with upcoming events. Thank you again for being here and good night. At Taco John's, we're blowing up your phone with great deals. The only problem is how many there are. Crunching, 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 crunching. Sorry, not sorry. Taco John's, bigger, bolder, better.